some of you here today, maybe you're needing to let go of trying to save your mom or your dad or your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your sibling and trying to be their savior and be their everything when who they truly need is God on high. And the only one that can hold their heart is God on high. And the only one that can mend their pain is God on high. You've gotta release and let go. We've been in a relationship series and just a a side note, I'm taking note of my bearings. Um, There's like boards on the floor and stuff because last time I was here, I tripped over this board right here. Anybody remember? Uh, I tripped over, you can laugh, that's okay. I tripped over this board, so I'm making sure I got my bearings down today, <laughs> making sure I got my corners so I don't fall off the stage. Um, but I, uh, we've been in a relationship series, and I love a relationship series because I believe it's so important to us, but it's also important to God the Father. And I want you to know why it's important to God, and I want you to know even this question, how much does he care about our relationships? He cares this much. He cares so much that he sent his son on the cross to die for your sins and mine so that we can be in relationship again in redemption with God the Father. You, his son, you, his daughter. Maybe you're here today and you're like, I, I, I'm not churched. I don't, I don't know what this is about. I just stepped foot in the door because I heard something about it. I just want you to know you're in a good place and you're in a safe place and you're in a place where you can meet our Heavenly Father and our Lord and Savior. You're in a place where you can transform and change your life from the inside out. He loved us so much and he cared so much about our relationship with God the Father that he decided to make this massive gesture and this massive moment of sacrificial love to give his one and only son. But then I was thinking about the Ten Commandments that Moses received on the top of Mount Sinai and brought down on the tablets. And as you think about the Ten Commandments, every single one of them has to do with one, either your relationship with God the Father or your relationship with others. In fact, there are five that relate to God the Father, and there are five that specifically relate to the way you interact with one another, the way you care, the way you love, the way you honor, the way you fear him and love others. And then I was thinking about Matthew 22, when the disciple asked him, what's the greatest commandment? Because we as humans like to have the one key, you know, give me the one thing that I need to do to know you and to, and to, and to change this world. And, and what's the one trick, you know, like Instagram and Facebook, that's everything right now. It's like, here's the key. Here's five steps. Here's what you do. This is all that you have to do to fix this, this, and this in your life. And, and I think that's what the disciples were asking him. What's my one thing? And he said this, to love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And without skipping a beat, without taking a breath, he said, and the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. Note that the disciple didn't ask for one and two. They just asked for one. But Jesus, in his infinite wisdom, knew that you cannot separate one and two. You cannot have one without the other. You cannot love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength, and not also love the one sitting next to you on your right and your left. He also knew that if you did love the one sitting next to you, it was going to require the power that it took from loving him first. It was going to require the Holy Spirit within you to love them when they're unlovable, to love them when they're struggling, to love them when it's not easy to love. They're mutually connected, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. You know, we think of these words, heart and soul, as like spiritual words. And so it's easy for us to access and relate to like, oh, yeah, yeah, I love the Lord with all my heart, because it's like a feely word. But then mind and strength are a little more difficult for us to understand and apply to our life because we think of our mind being used in our career. We think of our strength being used in our energies to to keep our house well and to cook dinners and to make sure that we're going on vacation resting and, and all of these practical areas of life that sometimes we don't relate to loving the Lord. But what if we used our mind 100% to love the Lord? What if we used our strength 100% to honor God the Father? What would happen in the the way that we did life if our relationships were actually based off of loving God the Father first? What would happen if we applied this idea of loving him with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength towards every aspect of the life that we lead and the life that we are in? I believe that there is a strength that he wants to give you that you haven't tapped into yet. 
I believe that there's something in your mind that he wants to release and renew and restore that it will allow you to love him on a deeper level than you've ever loved him before. I remember after Mila was born, I didn't know I could love <laughs> quite so much. And then all of a sudden when Issa, we were pregnant with Issa, I didn't know that I was gonna be able to love again quite so much. And then Eli, God gave a love that is a depth of love and he gives it an increasing amount <laughs> each time you need it. But it comes out of first a love from the Father. If we love the Lord our God with all of our mind, soul, heart, and strength, he gives us the ability to love our neighbor as ourselves. The other, last week, Mila was in a spelling bee. Any of your kids have been in spelling bees? Maybe you've been in a spelling, maybe you're a spelling, anybody won the spelling bee? Any, oh, okay, this is good. There's a, anybody else won the spelling bee that won't admit it? Okay, okay, there, I knew there was one, I knew. Um, Mila was in a spelling bee, and she goes to a fully bilingual school, it's beautiful, uh, and she, so there's six finalists out of 50 people, and she was one of the six, and she was so excited and so nervous. I've never seen her so nervous, but I, not as nervous as I was. I was like sweating, feeling worried, especially the first round, you know, it's like, don't, just don't miss the first word, because then I don't know how you're gonna feel afterwards, and it's gonna be tears, and, uh, I, and I don't want that for you. And so Mila, she gets to this spelling bee and she's doing so well actually she's already beat out like 50 people she's there's five left and then the the teacher comes on the mic and says uh we're running out of words and so <laughs> we're running out of words and so we may have a tie for first place and my jaw dropped you know tie a, a tie <laughs> a tie what do you mean a tie right I'm from the United States of America where we played 22 innings to finish a baseball game at 3 a.m. so that someone can win a tie. But here's the thing, that's weird because every other culture in every other country, uh, is, if a sport has been designed in that country, is okay with a tie. <laughs> soccer, I first got to, there, to Guatemala and I was playing soccer with some guys and I was like, what do you mean the game's over? It's one to one. How can that be over? We are keeping on playing, right? And I love a good competition. I love it. Uh, I, I'm not downplaying a good competition at all, but what I am saying is what happens when keeping score becomes a lifestyle? What happens when keeping score becomes a part of our relationships? What happens when it becomes a part of who we are? What happens whenever it's become a filter so deeply ingrained in our minds that we can't step out of it? And as I was studying this week, I just felt like there was something that's a simple idea, but an idea that I think will bring some freedom to our lives, some freedom to our relationships. And I want to talk and go back in the Bible. I've been reading the whole Bible, not as fast as Pastor Earl read it in a month, uh, but I have been reading through the whole Bible. And I, I want to take us all the way back to the beginning, because in Genesis and Exodus and some of the beginning stories, there is so much keeping score. And honestly, the New Testament too. There's so much keeping score in relationships that I want to break it down for us. Adam and Eve were in this most beautiful, in chapters one and two, they're in this beautiful garden, a full utopia, and their marriage is so unified and beautiful and no shame and no masks and it's just this perfect thing until chapter three it's like one chapter after creation and then chapter three something shifted something shifted and they begin to keep score and after Eve ate of the apple and the, the, the enemy, Satan, uh, the serpent, was convincing her that, hey, if you eat of the apple, then you're going to know uh, all the things that God knows. And so she's elevating self to eat, be equal with God. And as she does that, then she gives to Adam. And then Adam, <laughs> oh, so funny, he says, he looks to God and he's like, uh, but the woman you gave me made me do it. He's keeping score, he's blaming, he's throwing her under the bus. Just two seconds ago, they had this beautiful marriage and all of a sudden, he's like, she did it. She made me do it, but then guess what? That score keeping went into the next generation too and Cain and Abel, score keeping between brothers and score keeping and competition and, and, and comparison led to hate and anger and destruction and immediately we have something that shifts the dynamic of our world in chapter three. And we're going to pick up today just the one chapter later in chapter four, and the title of today's message is, Am I My Brother's Keeper? Am I My Brother's Keeper? Verse one says this, Adam made love to his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. 
Later, she gave birth to his brother, Abel. Now, Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? What are, why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? And he responded, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Am I my brother's keeper? I see it starting with Cain with a shake of the fist towards heaven. Anger, frustration at God. Why is he blessed and I'm not? Why is he chosen and I'm not? Why is he accepted and I'm not? Why is he receiving all of this? Why did they get the promotion and I didn't? The, the fist shaking towards heaven in, in, the, in, the, in the physical sense, maybe you haven't landed at that place, but in the heart, you've landed at that place towards God on high. In the mind, you haven't, you haven't reached that place, but in your soul, the, the, the love for the Lord and the hardening of the heart has already begun a process of reaction to end up at the same place. And I believe that God wants to speak to us today about this idea because maybe he was plowing the field with cynicism. And cynicism didn't feel so bad, but then it began to grow. Maybe he was plowing the field with sarcasm, and it didn't feel so bad when it was just sarcasm, but then it was growing as he didn't realize. Maybe, maybe he was sweating and laboring and toiling with vengeance in his heart, with keeping score in his mind. I can imagine somewhere in all the questioning, he lost the fear of the Lord and the honor for God on high. He lost the realization for who he was living for and the way he was caring. A hardened heart towards God will distance us from our brother, and a hardened heart towards our brother will distance us from God. They're mutual, they're together, they're inseparable. Again, we see the connection of our relationship with God. Matthew 5, 23 says, Therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar first and go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. God is saying in this moment, I don't want your gift if you hate your brother. I don't want this yet. I want you. I want to be in relationship with you. I care for you, but you've got to honor your brother first. This week, literally last night, as I was studying, I, I was reviewing this verse, and as I got to this verse, I felt the Lord so strongly, but so gently as well, lead me to repentance. I felt like he said, if you're gonna teach this, you have to forgive the hurts that have been deeply rooted in your heart for, for far too long. If you're gonna teach this, you've gotta deal with some of these things first. And there were three things that he brought to my mind. And maybe for some of us, there's some things and some people's faces he needs to bring to your mind right now with some forgiveness in your heart so that you can then bridge the gap to your relationship with God the Father. Because you've been feeling a little hardened. You've been feeling a little stale, hardened heart, and you don't feel like you know exactly why your relationship with the Lord isn't moving like you want it to, but he's asking you to bring some forgiveness and healing and honor back into your life for others. So then your relationship with him can be so uniquely designed and perfectly put together. So for me, it was a moment about 10 years ago whenever someone that I loved and respected and honored said some deeply hurtful words about my career path and my, my, my success. And I had to forgive. The second one was this. It was about when we were getting ready to move from Guatemala I mean, from, from Dallas to Guatemala and quit our jobs of engineering and nursing and we were taking a leap of faith and, and, and had some hard conversations about a, a, some questioning of will this really work? Will it work to have a, a church that's also bilingual, that has Spanish and, and English, that has people that are, that are from all over and Guatemalans and you're reaching them together as one beautiful picture of heaven and, and I believe that it would work and God showed them that it, that it would work. But some of those words I had to get healing from. And finally, 
an incredibly difficult situation that I had to get healing from, from someone that I loved and respected, but that I had questioned and, 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 and really just been hurt and offended towards me as their leader. And I had to get healing. And last night, as I sat on the floor of my room crying, I asked the Lord to heal me. <laughs> but the way he healed me from these was by forgiveness of them. <laughs> it's hard to love your brother when you still haven't forgiven your brother. It's hard to build this relationship God is calling you to with him whenever your relationships with others are still broken. So I'm asking us today, who is it that we've got to forgive? Because forgiveness is the beginnings of honor. Honor starts with forgiveness. Honor st starts with forgiveness. If you want to bring your best to God first, you must learn to honor your brother. But honor starts with forgiveness. Honor starts with healing. Honor starts with care. Let's talk for a minute about the offering that he brought because this is interesting. They brought two different offerings. One brought um, fruit of the land, some fruit of the land, it says, and the other brought uh, fat portions from the firstborn of the calves. And I was thinking about this, and, and, and it's funny because these days we don't offer, we don't have offerings at the altar necessarily, not in this culture at least, and, and we don't have that, that kind of to, to relate to. But what I want you to understand is Romans 12, 1 says, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Your life is the offering. What you do is, an, is the offering. But hear, hear this so, so, so clearly. I'm not talking about an offering to gain salvation because salvation is a gift from heaven and it is given by grace and not by works and it is given by faith alone and it is saying, God, God, I, in response to the salvation you have given, saying, I want to build my life as an offering to you. It's a difference. There's not, you're not trying to gain salvation. You're trying to respond to salvation as you give your life as an offering for him. So what type of life are we giving? Are we giving of the first fruits or of our leftovers? Because I know when I tell our kids we're having leftovers for dinner, they all run to the other room <laughs> and grab a snack on their way. <laughs> the afterthought or the intentional? Are we living the sacrificial or are we living the easy? Are we living the best or the easy to find, easily accessible? Are we living the quickest way? Are we living the cultivated way? Because that one requires some pain. The other day, Whitney, she is the queen of ambiance. She loves ambiance in our home, and it is, it's, it's rainy season in Guatemala right now, and so the weather is like 65 degrees and rainy every afternoon. It's my favorite season of the year. It's much different than the balmy 122 degrees that you're <laughs> here in, in Dallas. <laughs> I love Dallas, but I ran out the airport and I was like, never mind. <laughs> I'm headed back to rainy season. Um, but Whitney loves ambiance, and, and so we have this fireplace, and she wanted to start a fire in the fireplace the other day, and I said, of course. And so I went to get the firewood, and, and we didn't have any <laughs> left. And where we live now, traffic can either be 10 minutes to go get something or an hour and a half, depending on the moment. Well, this moment was an hour and a half moment, and so I was working through it, and my brain is, I want to love you, baby. I want to prepare the ambiance, but this is like it's raining outside, and it's like an hour and a half, <laughs> so I got creative, <laughs> and I found this little place that was like just down the road that's a, a tortilla shop, and their homemade tortillas are the best tortillas you've ever had, and so I went, and, and I had never met the lady before, but I went, and I said, hey, um, would you happen, in Spanish, uh, would you happen to have some firewood you could sell me? <laughs> And the lady looked at me and she was like, we sell tortillas. <laughs> and I was like, I know there's firewood close. And so she was like, por supuesto, un momento. And she grabbed her son and her daughter and she sent them on their way. And I think I was supposed to follow. And so I followed. <laughs> and we went up this hill and a little around the corner and behind this house. And there was firewood for sale. <laughs> so I paid them double because I'm really grateful in this moment for this firewood. And I take it back to home. And Whitney's so excited. And we create this beautiful fire. And, and the only thing is they only had one kind of like five pieces of fire. So it was only good for one night. So the very next night when he's asking, can we create a fire again? And I was like, well, all we have left is like the half burned Wood, you know, anybody been there? And so I was like, if I throw a few starter logs on it, maybe I can get it to last for like another 30 minutes or something like that. And so I did, and, and we got it to go, but the flame was less than the night before. The heat was less than the night before. The beauty was less than the night before. And I believe that maybe some of us are living our lives and our relationship with Christ on half-used firewood. 
and a little bit trying to make something last, but the flame is dwindling. And we actually don't know why. But here's the thing, I believe that what God was asking me in this situation was to find it, whatever it takes. Find the extra log to put on the fire. Find the sacrifice that it takes. Find what it takes to make sure that that flame doesn't go out. Make the search. Take the steps. Go get it in the rain. Sit in the hour and a half traffic. Look for what you need to make sure, make sure, make sure that the flame doesn't go out. Because here's the thing, if you feel half burned up, if you feel half burned out, the flame is weakening. I believe he's asking you to put another piece on the firewood to put another piece on the fire, put something else on the altar in your life. Maybe you never said yes to a serve team and today is your day to say yes. Maybe you've never said yes to connect group because you're scared of vulnerability, but today is your day to join a connect group. Today is your day to say yes to something he's asking of you to put on the altar of the Father and say, God, you have my everything. If you feel half burned up, I promise you, he wants to rekindle that flame and he wants to give you exactly what you need in order to do so, but it's going to require a yes in your heart. It's going to require some healing, some forgiveness, some dealing with some pain, and some taking a step forward. Let's close out this story with this verse. The Lord said in verse 10, what have you done? He's talking to Cain. Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops. You will be a restless wonder on the earth. And I, th I read this word, restless wonder, and I thought of myself sometimes. I thought of many of us who are feeling like we're in a season of restlessness, discontentment, like, Worry has overtaken us. Like we, we, we are living in a pandemic in our day and age of discontentment because there's, there's, it, it almost, we've lived in it so long that it's become so normal to us because we just mask our discontentment with more work or we mask our discontentment with spending more money or we mask our discontentment with, 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 with uh, eating more ice cream. <laughs> I'm gonna do that definitely today because the ice cream here compared to Guatemala, you can keep score on this. <laughs> It is not a competition. <laughs> I will be eating some before I leave today. Um, maybe you're restless about the future. Maybe you're anxious about today. Maybe you're wondering about why has your peace left you. But I just want to declare over us if you're in this place, I want to declare over you that there is a peace that surpasses every understanding of your mind and of your heart. And I promise you the God of all peace that wants to give you that promise is here today. And his presence is here today, and his presence is very active and moving in this house. And I believe that he wants to release a wave of peace over this church body, a wave of contentment, understanding that we only find our hope and our, our calling and all that he's asked us to, not in comparison and keeping score and in competition, but in God the Father and in our identity in him. There is a peace that awaits us as we walk with God the Father. Discontentment has become so normalized, but here's what I want you to understand about Adam and Eve. It's hard to find contentment when we've elevated self to the same level of God. When we've elevated self to the same level as God. So listen to these five words of what human nature produces. Self-promoting, self-seeking, self-preserving, self-securing, and self-trusting. We, we trust ourselves because we know ourselves we, we, we preserve we, we, because we're fearful. We, 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 we promote ourselves because we want to look good. Self is what happened to Adam and Eve in this moment because the enemy, the Satan, the, the serpent came to her and said, you'll know all things like God does if you eat of this fruit. She's, she's elevating self, but it's incredibly difficult, actually impossible to find contentment when we've elevated self to the same level of God. And what I see in Cain is similar, but let me add one more word. It's hard to find contentment when comparison has the loudest voice. It's hard to find contentment when comparison has the louder voice, has the loudest voice in our lives. I, I believe that we as humans are like a, a bank account. We think that more for, if we spend here, that means the account goes lower. If we, if we get an income, that means the account is raised. And, and we think that God is the same way. If someone else has a blessing, that must mean less for us. If someone else receives a promotion, why didn't I get seen? 
And it's, it is human nature at its finest, and it is competitive, and it is comparative. And, and the other day, Mila and Issa, we, Eli has reached a point where he really likes food, and he doesn't like to share his food with others. And so I, we're beyond the moment where I can just feed him a few bites off my plate, so we have to buy him a whole meal. And the other day, we, bought, uh, we made a bad mistake, uh, and we bought little ice cream cones for Mila and Issa, not realizing that Eli was at the stage of an ice cream cone in his mind. And we were dealing with screaming, a lot of screaming on the way home. And I kept telling Mila, can you please share it with him? Issa, can you please share it with him? And they said, no, because he won't give it back. <laughs> no, because more for him is less for me. No. So finally, being a good dad, I gave him my ice cream cone because <laughs> I couldn't handle the screaming anymore. I see your judgmental faces. <laughs> He's almost two. He's fine. He can have some sugar. We compare, did you see their wedding? Did you see how young they are and they just went to Europe? How come I didn't get to do that? Did you see how beautiful their family is all put together? How come when I take a family photo, it looks like we just went to a tornado in a paint store <laughs> and a hurricane of bad moods and it's, it's chaos? <laughs> how do they do that? <laughs> Still trying to figure that one out. This picture you saw a second ago is not how we look most of the time. <laughs> Comparison will keep you distant from God because you cannot love him with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength and constantly be comparing. It's impossible. Comparison will steal your contentment because you'll be a restless wonder. And finally, comparison will blind us. I have four siblings. Um, my old, I, I was, they're amazing. And so I tried to compare myself to them. My older brother, he would always one-up me in like, um, like, like sports and working out. And so if I put on some muscle and I could bench press more, he was like five pounds ahead of me. My older sister, Erin, she was always kinder than me. You know, I, was, I tried to be a nice person, but she just, she was nicer every time. She was just, a lit, Celeste, she was always smarter than me. Uh, I would work like 10 hours on a test and she would study for like 10 minutes. You know that kind? I think that's probably one I have to forgive still. <laughs> and then Joanna, she was just always the one that everybody, my younger sister, that everybody liked. And I tried to let people like me, but they just liked her more always. And I spent so much of my time, these are jokes, but I spent so much of my time trying to be and live like someone else's pathway and calling that I forgot to ask God, what about what you want me to do? Comparison and competitiveness will blind us to the fullness of what God has for us and to the direction that he's asked us to. You can, the problem with comparison is this. If you win, it turns to pride. If you lose, it turns to shame. If you win, it turns to pride, and if you lose, it turns to shame. And I just believe that God's asking us in a moment to understand that though it's a simple term, and we've heard it a million times, and we can kind of laugh it off, I believe that it's affecting our relationships, not just with God the Father, but with our people around us. Let me close with this idea, the phrase, where is your brother Abel? The title is, am I my brother's keeper? And I believe sometimes when we hear that phrase, we think, am I my brother's savior? Am I my brother's keeper and am I my brother's savior are two very different phrases. And the answer to am I my brother's savior is absolutely not. There is one savior, there is one God, there is one king and one Lord. He is the alpha and the omega. He is the beginning and the end. He is the first and the last. He was before, he is now, and he will be after all is gone. He is your Jehovah Rapha. He is your provider. He is your savior. And no one else can take the place on his throne. So we get confused with him, my brother, Savior. And some of you here today, maybe you're needing to let go of trying to save your mom or your dad or your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your sibling and trying to be their Savior and be their everything when who they truly need is God on high. And the only one that can hold their heart is God on high. And the only one that can mend their pain is God on high. You've got to release and let go. But on the other hand, some of us need to hear this idea, or am I my brother's keeper? And I believe in this moment that as he's asking us, where is Abel? He's asking Cain, where is Abel? I believe he's putting a mandate on the life of Cain. He's calling attention and calling to account the life of Cain, saying, where's your brother? Have you seen him lately? How's he doing? How's his heart? <laughs> What's he up to these days? 
Some of us need to hear that he is explaining an expectation of the way he designed for brothers to live and love and care for one another. Not just brothers that are biological, but brothers in Christ, brothers and sisters in Christ, brothers in your connect group and sisters in your connect group, moms and dads, sisters and aunts and uncles and cousins. He is calling us to understand what it looks like to walk alongside, to keep and to care for, to love. We say we love people. It is a part of our 12 stones. It is who we are. Are we caring and keeping a brother and sister in Christ Jesus? I believe that he is, with this question, declaring a demand and an expectation on his created beings, you and I. He is explaining with minimal words his design. By design, he created us to be in each other's life. By design, he created us to keep and to care for one another. By design, he created us to walk alongside and to love and to honor and to say, hey, I, I'm here for you in the good and the bad. And maybe you're the one that needs to speak up when someone is drifting. When someone's lost, when someone is walking in a direction that you know will lead to toxicity and you know will lead to only pain. And maybe for you, you're on a serve team and, and you've been noticing this one person you haven't seen in a while and it's your turn to say, hey, how you doing? Can I walk alongside of you in the pain you're facing? Maybe for you, it's your desk mate and your, your coworker and, and they don't carry the same joy that they've been carrying before and something's going on and it's up to you because God has placed them in your life and in your circle of influence and in your realm, and he's saying, hey, are you gonna walk with this person? Maybe for you, you're the only one that's built trust with her to walk alongside of her whenever everyone else is celebrating the engagement and you need to walk alongside and ask the tough questions and walk alongside and, and show some red flags and, and have a tough conversation and be loving but be honest and care for her in the season of life. It's easier to celebrate, it's a lot harder to walk alongside in difficulty and pain. Can we be a church that cares for, walks alongside, and loves the people in our life? Can we be a church that shifts our focus from us to them? Instead of here I am, all of a sudden, can we shift church family to say, there you are, I see you, I know where you're at, I know what's going on in your life, I know you because I care for you, I'm because I'm with you in connect group and I'm with you in community and, I, and you're not just slipping in and slipping out, but you're here with me and I wanna make sure that I'm caring, honoring and keeping you. Can we walk alongside people? Because I believe that if God can, can heal some mended, some brokenness in our heart, we need to understand where hate has developed. We need to declare that the love will take place over hate. Where anger is beginning, I declare over this church family that contentment and peace will land and will rest. Where in, envy is settling in our hearts, I declare unity in this church body. I, will, I declare that we will walk alongside. And when he asks us, where is that person? We'll come alongside and say, hey, God, let me help them. Let me walk with him. If you don't mind, just bow your heads and close your eyes. Believe that God wants to bring some redemption in our relationships today, whether that relationship is, has been broken for quite some time or maybe it's something new and fresh in your heart. He's a healing God. He's a saving God. He's a loving God. His motives are pure for you. His design is beautiful for you. And maybe you're here today and you don't know Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You've never asked him to be the Lord of your life. You've never given him access, really, to guide and direct your life. But today, in this moment, the most important decision you can make, you want to say yes to the Father. We're going to do that in just a moment. You can repeat this prayer after me. But I also want to ask if there's anyone here today that you've asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life, but you, you've been headed in your own direction for far too long, and you need to rededicate your life to God the Father today. A rededication of life, a rededication of surrender and saying, God, yes again to you, and to your ways, not my ways, more of you and less of me. If you wanna ask the Lord into your heart or in salvation or in rededication today, I wanna ask you to do something simple but something bold, and on the count of three, just shoot your hand up towards heaven. One, two, three. Just a moment between you and the Father. Thank you, Jesus, for every heart, for every hand, for every soul represented, every mind. Thank you, Jesus, for surrender. Wait just one more moment. Saying yes to the Father. Thank you, Jesus. Every person under the sound of my voice, please just place your hand over your heart. Repeat this, this prayer after me. Dear Jesus, I admit that I have made mistakes. 
God, I ask that you forgive me of all of my sins. God, I give you my heart and I give you my life. Father, please give me the power to live for you each and every day. I love you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray and everybody together said amen. Clap your hands for those who said yes to the Father.